that's the cage there. That cage is up, of course, it's like a penguin system, but another one's up, another one's down. That cage is a double deck cage, you get four tubs in the bottom deck, four tubs in the top, and a tub it full of coal, that's a ton. So eight ton of coal can come up the pit each time. I reckon the, it's what he did this pit, it could do 40 tows an hour. So that's 320 ton of coal to come up the pit one day. Or you can get 30 men in the whole deck, 30 men in the top deck, that's 60 men. So if that cage would descend with 60 men, the other one's coming up with 60. So halfway up the shaft, that's 120 men. You'd be that shaft at one time. That's why the winding engine man's job is such a responsible job. With one mistake, that could cost the life of 20 men. Of course, he also decided that the winding engine man's job he could only sit at the winding engine for one hour only when his concentration had to be 100%. He wouldn't let him sit there any longer than one hour. But one hour up, so his neighbour would take over from him. So that's why, and of course, the manager would pick the most responsible guy he knew to do the winding engine job. Very responsible job. So the, the tubs came up the coal. Once it was level there, we push it off the slight gradient on the rails here, the top track. The tubs would come running down the track here, under the bridge, round here, under the bridge, round here, up here. See that chain in between the rails here? It's called a keeping chain. That would catch under the tubs and pull them up to that green hut there. That's the weight bridge. And the guy inside the hut will record the, the weight of the coal, the type of the coal, and what section it's come from. So we keep a very strict record of all the coal that's been lifted. That gentleman near the doors, that's a bank's man. Right. Before you then we come down the stairs along here, before they step to that cage, you would hand them the round token. They, should, they let them know who's just went down the pit, keep the square one on their person. When you come back up the end of the shaft, you'd hand them the square token to let them know they're back up safely. Okay? From the break. So this is the shaft, this was built or sunk way back in 1890, 1894. Took four years to sink that shaft, 530 metres deep. Two men were killed sinking that shaft. The side you just put the light shining in, was bricks, because when they finished sinking the shaft, the brick line didn't make it stronger and water type. So there's one of the cages there. This pit, very successful pit, everybody wanted to work here. The very old 1890, most modern pit in Scotland, it was the deepest pit in Scotland. It closed in March 1981 and produced 40 million tons of coal. So it seems a very successful pit and we really want to work here. You step off the cage, just there, but not your place of work. You're still going to travel one of these routes to get your place of work. You go up to Gorebridge, Almerson, Carrington, Bonnerig. Dalkey or East Houses, depending on what section you want. Just say if you say, Carmen, today you're working under Dalkey. It's about three miles from the pit bottom. You step off the cage here, you're 1,500 feet deep. The time you get under Dalkey, you're 2,700 feet deep. So the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. That's all the type of coal you get in the lady. See the bottom one, the parrot, that's the best coal. Of course, it's the best coal is because it's when it burns, it's got all our. Uh, a low say, ash content, so everybody with the steam engines wanted to buy the parrot coal. I think the Royal Navy called it their uh, secret weapon because when they burnt it, very uh, less reek came out of chimneys. Of course, Germans and all the rest were using ordinary coal, but you could see the, the, the smoke uh, plumes were about miles away. So the, the Royal Navy could actually sneak up them before they were spotted. So everybody wanted to buy, buy the parrot coal, that's one of the reasons that's a moment. Uh, uh, Archibald Hood went down and he opened all the pits in Wales, it was after the parrot coal in Wales. Uh, 
and never had any problem selling his coat. Best could then up there, you've got the great seam, which is over seven foot in height. Men could actually walk in down without, because the parrot is only three feet, so you're on your hands and your knees, but the great seam is over seven feet, so you could actually walk up and down. A lot easier to work, the great seam. They called it, the men called it the parrot coal because, well it's actually called canal coal. They called it uh, the parrot coal because when you put in a fire, you're going to split, you need splitting sounds. And one of the miners said that sounds like a parrot, so they called it parrot coal. It was the miners that named it themselves. These two circled areas, coal was never touched there because about two miles from here, you've got the Lothian Bridge next to the Sun Hotel. That was, Lothian Bridge was built about 1834. It's an 18 span uh, bridge, 18 arch bridge. And of course, you couldn't touch the coal underneath in case it affected the foundations. And you certainly couldn't touch the coal here. That was New Bottle Abbey. That's where the night mark with Lodian lived. And not a big extensive gardens. Nobody was going to mess his garden up. That's why you couldn't touch the coal there. Anybody got any questions? Okay. Right, we'll move on then to the next bit. Imagine you step in the cage. And when you step off the last step, it's like you're just stepping off the, the cage. Okay. The time you go the last step, you'll be 1,500 feet deep in the pit bottom. Okay, let's go. You're 1,500 feet deep underground. But you're not your place to work, remember. You've still got another half of the walking to do before you get to your section, section 31 under Dalby, with the parrot cola. So, of course, and this pit was owned in 1890. This pit was the most modern pit behind Scotland. It had electric lights, which was lit up. It had the clean air coming down the shaft, nice fresh air. So, eventually, you'd be walking for a half an hour, you get to the door here, this is the section 31 that you'd be working. It's like another world in there. There's no light, all the light you've got is the one you've got, this one, the electric light. Just Mother Nature's trying to crush the roof. In the floor up, there's bits of wood and stone falling upon the thing. It's like an obstacle course, so you've got to watch, you've got to keep on your walking, you don't trip over anything. Just make sure you get hard on because you can get hit, something will fall out the roof and hit you in the head. Of course, the airflow as well. It's different half, by the time you get to that section, because it's travel through other woods. It's 12 air base, it's warm, 30 degree heat. Not very nice. So they say, right, we'll put that section out. And of course, for your benefit, it's a nice flat floor, light, and that's for your benefit. If you've used your imagination, you wouldn't be actually, a cold road wouldn't be like this. Walk in here, the heat, the first thing you've got to notice is the heat. Lights here, from the pair of nice cool air out there, but it's 30 degree heat in here, it's hot. In the corner there, there's an electric generator as for the motor to give this section power. That generates a lot of heat as well, contributing to the 30 degree heat. And here is a pump. That's going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because if it wasn't for the pump, this section would flood. So the pump, you rely on the pump to keep the, uh, the water levels down. But it generates a lot of heat, the pump also contributing to the heat in this section. Right, let's we'll start walking now. This is luxury for the miners, chop walk and a strap, this is where they get their piece. So when you arrive just here, you're taking, so you leave your jacket here and leave your piece hanging here. And there's a problem. Vermin. Rats. And this bit in eight, uh, sorry, 1900, they brought down 70 ponies to pull the coal from the face line for the pit up. Because ponies lived in here. They had to get fed. Of course, the rats made their way down the shaft, and this was perfect breeding conditions for the rats. It was warm too, but there was no summer or winter, but it was the same temperature all the time doing the pit. Plenty of food for them, plenty of nooks and crannies for them to hide in. So, the men would go to their pit to work. Just leave their peace with you, and the rats, if they interfere with the men's peace, you get a disease off it called the Wells disease, it can kill you. 
Men that come out for their feast, they didn't realise it's been tampered with the rats. They just start eating. And of course, they could eat them at dead. As well as disease. So you can understand the rats were not the best friend of miners. So what they used to do is they'd get their own back once a year. Miners get two week holiday. And what they do at the end of the road, get two shaped tubs at the end of the road. Get straps like this, up the side. What side? And as we were passing in the last day, any food they had left for the feast was thrown to the bottom of the tubs. And of course, they took the ponies with them. They got two week holidays, well, about, so they met her out the pack for two weeks, the ponies were out the pack for two weeks holiday. Because it was all quiet, the rats would come out their nooks and crannies or hidey holes. Eat the last of the pony food, then they'd get hungry. And they'd smell the food in the bottom of the tubs rotting away. So they'd run out the straps and jump out of the tubs when they're trapped. Eat the last of that food. It's got hunger again, what have you started eating? So they like, each other. Men would come back after a two week holiday, look in the tubs, there'd be two or three big fat rats left, they just got the shovel, quack, quack, quack. Had to do something, because the, the, the rats were, the disease that they were getting, the poison was killing the men, so I had to do something. So that's that. Walk along here, first, come to the first aid station. Every deputy, Every since I'm a deputy, he's responsible for your health and safety. He's trained in your first aid. You'd just be in the sex just room corner, that's the face line, the most dangerous place to work. You've had a bad accident, your pals would rip out, get the stretcher, bring you here, and the deputy would then give, to the best of the ability, give you first aid treatment. And if you're in great pain, within this concrete box here, concrete box, metal box, he's always got a key for it, that's where you keep the pethidine. He then has the pethidine to kill your pain. And your pals will get your stretcher up, get from here, from the pit bottom as quickly as possible. Hopefully, the time you get up the shaft, there's an ambush waiting for you to get in to the hospital. Okay? Two minutes is uh, 19, late 1920s, early 1930s. It shows you how they uh, cut the coal, produce the coal, and all these prior to mechanisation. So you'll see that coming up in a minute. That's old type cut machine. Cuts out the bottom of the coal, three or four feet, undermines the coal. But we're at the every face line, with an intake road, with a return road. This will be the intake road, the air coming up here along the face line. We've got to get that up the, the road level with the face line, so it's bored the holes, you put the, the explosives in, as a fire and put the explosives in, and when he's ready, he'll shout. So once all the dust clears, the men will walk in. First thing they've got to do, obviously, is check the roof and everything, make sure it's safe, put the oil to bury the line. You start bringing up the big bits of coal. Shove it onto the belt, clear your feet, put the loose stuff down, onto the belt there, because you want the 30 degree heat, but take the work, keeps you fit. So you want to clear your feet, but you've got to start supporting the roof for your advance. Get the supports up. Smart on the old belt. And when you lay the new belt, the face like always advanced, always going forward. Okay, come this way now. So this is the face line. That's your shearer. You see there, it's a double ending ranging drum shearer. That's what they call it. It was invented about 1952-53. A guy called James Anderton from the Middletons. Uh, that's the pick. See the pick spin, the disc spins round. That's the pick there. That's the loose one here. The tip of each pick is tungsten steel. Very heavy, solid thing. A disc in the front, a disc in the back, 
four boxes here. Give box and water for the front, and give box and water for the back. Now go on down the three slide, take a cut and call all the time. This is your roof support here. Four legs to each support. I mean the brass. If I had that with my pick and my shovel, there wouldn't be a spark because if there's methane in the atmosphere, a spark could cause an explosion. So that's why I need the glass. That's the control angle there. How you control uh, the roof support. So once the shield goes to the further end, so we're not going to have to read down that way. That's just when you advance your supports. You put to the first level, you draw the ship between two legs. Hit the other flexible conveyor, push up against the face line. The next one, you drop the roof a couple inches. Number three, the, the ram and then pull the, the roof support forward up against the new position of the other flexible conveyor. And lastly, push up against the support roof again. So the when you're walking in underneath the support, you're safe. But behind you, there's nothing, the base. So if you go forward, the roof bends and drop the boom. And you just drop the So you always make sure you're not working underneath the other boards here. Very dangerous job. Of course, you've got the height here. This is the, the great scene I was telling you. My apartment is shooting up a Scottish bit. It's over three feet. So you're on your hands, your knees. Because if an accident happens, the middle of the face line. Jump up and run. That's what you hope you never get hurt. Very dangerous. Hot, dusty, noisy. The noise of the shearer, the noise from the down reflects what the bear is. Bars, the chains, the tension, the rattling. So all that noise. So sometimes the miners have to make uh, signaling systems up in their cells. No. Yes. Come here. Yeah, and that's how they communicate with each other. They can hear that there's that much noise. That's all. Do you have any questions with the face line? No? I'm going to do that. You order a tiny coal, you're not going to pay for a tiny coal that's got dust and dust now. You want, you want the coal clean, you pay for a tiny coal, that's all you want. So once it's been cleaned, you'd end up with these big hoppers here. We tub, we uh, pug, they come along the black pug, probably 10 or 12 of these wagons. Each wagon contains 12 tiny coal, gets allocation of coal, make its way down that way. That far fence that we used to be there, probably another mile of track, there was a coal yard. Ten or twelve of these pugs have gone up and down with empties and fuel ones. Further to the right was the main national line, the railway the railway line we call it. Take the coal up to the borders, the ruling mills, and to Embra for the foundries or to the power stations. They could burn anything. All the rubbish and the drops they could burn anything. Okay? There's a wee valve broken in it. Trying to get a hold of this spare part has been very difficult. But there's a team of amateurs who look after this. They're in the process of finding that valve and hope to get up and running soon. Once we get up and running soon, we get it all cleaned again and repainted and back to how its former glory. Imagine this was steam though, Kennedy. 
if you can get back to it being steam. It's electric. Uh, once you turn it in the mine museum in 1894, uh, they converted from uh, steam to electric. Once the shaft is finished, then you can start uh, building this. But I had to get this bolt for the obviously get the main up and down the pit and for the coal. Just behind the, uh, the flag there is the winding engine. We're up to go round out the drum, up through that window, up to the pit gears, down the shaft, connect to the cage. Of course, this was steam power. It's one of the most powerful, biggest steam powered uh, winding engines in Scotland in its day, 1894. In 1903, we were testing the brakes on the drum. And of course, in the old days, room four, it was a mahogany wood, wood on the side. And when they were testing the drum, sparks began to fly over here. Some of the sparks got into the wood, tend to discover the fire, got to control, and burned for 24 hours. As that fierce a fire, it broke the rope in the shaft. The cage went crashing down the shaft. Luckily nobody was killed because there was plenty of warning and the men were underground. They escaped the second shaft because every put us have two shafts, the lingering was shaft across other road there. So they were able to escape for that one, so they were lucky. There was nobody actually killed. They affected production here for six months. So we're doing that six months, we put metal floor down, we put these white tiles inside the bottom. There's not another fire after that, so it done its job. A lot of the older folk that come in here, they'll look at the, the, the walls of the white tile and say, Reminds me of one of these Victorian toilets. Okay, with the white tiles. If you went to Edinburgh or due to London, that, if you went to the toilets, so I these white tiles over there. But it done its job, but there was another, another fire. You come this way now, show you how it worked. So the wing engine was set in that chair there. And it seems you'd only sit there for one hour, because you reckon his constitution had to be 100% and that would last an hour. Because after an hour he'd get up and his neighbour would take over, he'd probably go and do some oil and clean the engine. So uh, the, the, the black uh, beam there, see that? That represents the shaft. You see the brass marker there? That would let him know exactly where the, the, the cage was at all times in the shaft. Because remember he's sitting there, he can't see what's happening in the shaft or a bit of there. That's how he knew where the stage was in the shaft at all times. Now there's a speedometer, it can go faster for the material flow and what have you, and for men, for safety, you can go a bit slower. Just the back there, there's three boxes for line, three boxes, electrical signal. You've got a box for the pit bottom, a box for the bit head, and a box for the winding instrument. So it's electrical messages can come up from these boxes to help them uh, understand what's going on. There's a bell system as well. You see that marker there on the drum? It's got an arrow with a white marker there. Because remember, he's sitting there, actually, he can't see what's happening on the ground. So he knows when that arrow lines up that white marker, he knows the cage is dead level at the pit bottom. So the men can step off and run safely, plus the wagons can come off of him as well. So that's what the marker is for. Very, very responsible job to wind the engine. And they're all very proud of their, I can't remember, 10 men probably working, oiling, cleaning, painting, keeping us uh, immaculate at this point. Thank you very much. No problem. Glad to help.